Take your Bible, would you, and look over to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Last week we looked in chapter 4, and tonight we're going to look in chapter 5 for a few minutes. As you're turning there, I want to remind you, take opportunity to look at your bulletin this week and how you can be involved in the life of the church, how you can pray for the ministries of the church, what God is doing. Next week, as we've been announcing, is our annual meeting. We'll be electing our officers for the new year in the morning during the Sunday school hour and after service, after Sunday school. And then in the evening, it's going to be our annual meeting coming together, uh, vision time and sharing with you, hearing from our pastors. But I encourage you to be here. It's going to be a good time. Invite somebody to come and join you. But I think it's really important for us as our leadership can share with us their heart, share with where, where they've come from, but also where they're going. And it gives an opportunity of accountability, but also an opportunity of encouragement. As a pastor, uh, it's always interesting. You know, we have district assembly every year, and this year we're hosting district assembly here at Rogers First. We do that every other year. Starting this year, it's going to be every three years. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Next year, it will be in Jonesboro, and then the year after, it'll be back in Greenbrier, and then it will be back here. So they're going to spread our joy out just a little bit, add another year into the process. But at district assembly is the only time that I'm accountable to the district, to the district that I serve on. That is when I give a pastor's report. And uh, my accountability lasts about a minute and a half. That's what usually the pastor's report is. And, and, and sometimes churches, are going, people are going, oh, let's get this over with. Or, yeah, for me, it usually lasts three to five minutes. That's true. Yes, my accountability does last longer, thank you, and my report is just that, that short. Thank you. My accountability is all year long, but that's when it's called, I'm called to account. Maybe that's the better way. You know, here at a local church, I'm called to account each board meeting, uh, and then, of course, before you each Sunday. But an opportunity for us just to, to tell kind of where we're going, what's important, and, and what, uh, what God has done this year, and I think that's worth celebrating and and recognizing what, what God is doing. Well, Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians to a, to a group of people, a church where he started, a church that he planted on one of his missionary journeys. I believe it was the second journey. And they were, they were new to their faith. They were, they were believers. They, they loved the Lord. But there were a lot of questions. There were just a lot of uh, questions that came up in their, in their mind. And, and but what's fascinating about 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians is really when you listen to what Paul's words, they were a model of the Christian faith. They were a model of what it meant to be a disciple. And so in this letter, he, he responds to them, he, he, he applauds them, he encourages them, he blesses them, and he, he literally says that their faith is going out around the world their generosity, the, the, their depth of, of insight, but, but it's a new faith. It's, it's a young faith. And so he comes back to them and he talks about how their, their faith is produced. It's uh, the work produced by faith, the labor prompted by love, and endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what a testimony of a, of a church. And then he goes on and he talks about leadership. He talks about parenting in the book. He talks about spiritual growth, and, and then he spends a considerable amount of time talking about the second coming, when Jesus is going to return. The, the church was, was very uh, questioning of what was happening because they thought Jesus was going to come back in a short period of time within their lifetime, and, and, and time had gone by, and Jesus hadn't come back, and they were concerned that maybe they missed him. Maybe you know, they weren't really part of the family of God. And so Paul writes to them about about the end times and what to expect. But he, he's very proud of these Christians. He's very proud of these, these believers in Thessalonica. And he, he even calls them at one point his hope and his joy. His hope and his joy. And, and these guys really, they seemed to have it, have it going. They, they were on the right track. They were, they were doing good things and they were living in such a, a way, a powerful way, and in a committed way that it was evident to other people around them. Uh, Paul says something like that in Ephesians chapter 3 where he says, God is able to do far more than we can ever ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers and desires, thoughts, and hopes. 
that when we trust in Him, when we yield to Him, when we seek Him, it opens up the door for Him to work and for Him to lead. But Paul wanted them not to stop. He wanted them to keep growing. We talked about that last week. So he's encouraging them to move forward, to keep, to keep growing in their faith, keep, keep moving forward. Don't just be satisfied. And, and, and at the same time, he says, be content in your circumstances, but, but, but stay on that growing edge. Keep moving forward with Christ. And so he comes back in the kind of the conclusion of his letter, this first letter to Thessalonians. And he, he reminds them, as he encourages them to keep on growing, keep moving forward, he reminds them kind of who they are. And he, and he uses a phrase or he uses uh, some images here in these verses we're going to look at of family. He says, we are family. I think the rain has come in. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you're inside? So, I love the rain. May it water the earth and cause everything to grow, except for my lawn. I like that. I like that. That's, that's wonderful. It will pack all that mulch that we put down and all the mulch in Allen Miner's driveway. We'll pack it down. So he reminds these, these Christians in Thessalonica in, 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 verse, in these 16 verses here in this last little chapter about what it means to be family. One of the favorite verses that Paul uses over and over and over again in his letters is the term brothers. And I think we can, we can imply here brothers and sisters. He, he's talking about family. He's talking about being part of one another in the body of Christ. And in the 13 books that he writes in the New Testament, Paul uses the term brother over 60 times. 27 times just in First and Second Thessalonians. And five times in this passage that we're going to look at tonight. And in doing so, he reminds them and he reminds us who we are. Family. Connected together. That there's a joint bond between those who claim to know Christ, who have been forgiven of their sins, who have been brought into this, this kingdom. And so we're going to look at some of, these, uh, some of these scriptures tonight that he's saying, I want you to grow, but I want you to grow as family. I want you to grow in your faith, but I want you to grow in your faith together. I want you to serve and I want you to, to be useful to God, but I want you to be useful in the body where it makes a difference in the group because family matters, whether it's your physical family or it's your spiritual family. We are in this thing together, he's saying. And so he finds it necessary in these last few verses in this book to talk about what it means to be, to be a family of God and talk about the, the issues that, that relate to being that family, not just a husband and wife, not just a parent, but being family members together. And we're going to divide this into two parts, and we'll see how far we get. I may have to wait until two weeks from now to finish, but we're going to talk about family responsibilities, and then we're going to talk about family policies. And, and they're really two different things. A family responsibility, you do this, you do that. Uh, policy is, is the way we do it, and, and how it's to be carried out. One of the things we, we did in our home when Paula and I first got married, Paula cleaned houses while we were going through college. And so I would tack along with her and help her clean the houses, and then she would help me do things with student government. Um, we were, do you think I'm an overachiever now? You should have seen me in college. I took 23 hours a semester. I was married. I was student body president. I was the music director at a church. I also helped Paula clean houses. And then I, I studied in between all of those times, all night long. Yeah. So it started back then, out of control, out of control. But we found out very quickly when we were cleaning houses together, they were her houses, but I just wanted to spend time with her. At least that was her excuse for me to come along and help. And so she would put a dust rag in my hand and say, okay, go in here and dust. And, and I thought I was doing a good job. You know, when I dust, I just, I dust on the table and I go in here and I just go around here and I go around there and I'm done. No, Paula says, no, you have to lift everything up and dust underneath. Do you know what I mean? 
I don't see why. You never look under there. So, but one thing that I could do and she didn't like to do was vacuum. So I became the vacuumer. And all through our marriage, I'm the vacuumer. She does the restroom. She does the dusting. I do the vacuuming when I'm home. That's true. That's wrong. But there's responsibilities. But there's also policies of what we do and what we don't do and how we do it. And, and so, so Paul lays out these responsibilities. I heard of a, a little league coach that uh, during the game, he called one of his little players over and he, and he said to the player, he says, do you understand how team is to work? And the little boy said, well, yeah. And he said, do you understand that it matters that we win as a team? And the little boy says, I, I think I do, yes. And the coach says, well, when a strike is called or, or you are out at first, you don't argue or curse or attack the umpire. Do you understand that? And the little boy says, yes, I do. And the coach says, good. Now go tell that to your mother. <laughs> family relationships. For a family to function well, it takes teamwork. It takes, it takes teamwork in our home. It takes teamwork in our church. It takes the ability to get along. It takes the ability to do tasks that other people, you're good at one thing, I'm good at one thing. And then if we do our things, then all of a sudden it works together. An illustration of like our work day. We get so many people out here doing so many different things, and some are good at uh, pressure washing, and some are good at the windows, and some are good at putting the mulch down, and, and some are good at doing a little more intricate stuff, working on the, the, the electrical system and things like that. Not everybody has the same skill, but they're all part of the family. It's all part and parcel of the team. And so as we work together as a team, there's different responsibilities, there's different jobs, there's different things to do, and yet they all contribute. They're all part of that. Maybe you've done that in your home where your kids and, or your spouse, you've, you've allotted certain responsibilities. And I think one of the hard parts about an empty nest is when your kids grow up and leave home is you get so used in those years of assigning certain responsibilities like mowing the lawn or taking care of the dog, and then when they leave, it all falls back on you. You know, there's some challenges there, part of family. Happens in the church, doesn't it? We have somebody that does something so significant and they move away or they pass away and, and all of a sudden there's a hole there and somebody has to step into that. Sometimes it's they get piled onto somebody else. But the, the goal is that we, as a family, we work together as a, as a team. A little girl was trying to tie her shoe and so her mom and dad worked with her pretty diligently for for weeks and months and finally got her to learn how to tie her shoes on her own. And, uh, and they thought she would be elated, but as soon as she did it on her, her own and it was just perfect, she burst into tears. And her mom and dad were going, what's up? What's, what's wrong with that? I mean, you just learn to tie your own shoes. This is wonderful, sweetie. What's, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And she started crying. She says, because now I have to do it all by myself for the rest of my life. And there's something about working together as a team and encouraging each other. And there's different ways of doing it. There's different responsibilities. But here's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 12. He says, Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. He lays out some responsibilities. This is how we act in the family. Here's what we do. He says, work hard. Take effort. Put yourself into it. And, and the word he uses here is toil, strive, achieve, struggle, grow weary in doing what you're doing. It, it is, it's work. And, and, you know, being a leader, being a participant, being a family member, sometimes is hard work. And especially being a leader, to take over the responsibilities of leading a family or leading a church or leading a ministry or leading a class, leading some role. It's toil sometimes. It's work sometimes. But that's why family is often so hard because it involves people. 
It involves working together. Now, you've heard it, I've heard it. People say, well, you know, ministry wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for all these people. Or people will say that about their job. Well, I really like doing my job, but if I didn't have to work with people, it would be so wonderful. And we forget that every job is about people. All of the only thing that we do in life, everything has to do with somebody else to help them and encourage them. And he says to work hard. Work hard at what you do. Toil at you what you do. Strive at what you do. Second thing he says is be worthy of respect. It's not only doing a good job and doing, doing it and working your best at it, but he's saying do it in a such a way that you earn the respect. You know, it's hard to follow somebody that you don't respect, isn't it? It's hard to follow somebody that you don't, you don't trust their word or you, you, you doubt their credibility. Uh, you, you're, you struggle with their life. And yet, it, whether you're a manager or a coach or a father or a, a leader or a mom, it's, it's always easier to, to lead people when you live a life worthy of respect. And you think, well, what is it that, that causes us to respect somebody? You may go back to the first point. Work hard. Somebody carries their own weight. Somebody does their part. Somebody's going above and beyond. They practice what they preach. They live out of their values. We talked about this morning that, it, that exudes in who they are. Their, their word can be trusted. They're honest. They're kind. They're, they're compassionate. They're caring. They treat others with respect. They're worthy of respect. Work hard, be worthy of respect. Third thing he says is correct wrong behavior. Now, I think that's probably the hardest thing about being family. It's easier just to leave it alone, sweep it under the carpet, act like it's not an issue, but you're really not family when you do that. Family goes ahead and has those hard conversations and has those difficult times. And one of the responsibilities, especially of a family leader, is to correct wrong behavior. And it's not easy to do. But Paul reminds us it's necessary. Look at, at uh, Hebrew. Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I, I, I was in sports all through junior high, actually elementary school and junior high and high school, and then I switched over to the music uh, when I figured out I wasn't going to be a professional ball player. I, I finally switched over to music full-time and did all that as my leisure activity. But in sports, it was hard work. I mean, we had to run up and down the bleachers. We had to run around the field constantly, and we had to, we had to wear our, our, believe it or not, I played tackle all through high school up until my senior year, and it was just, it was grueling, hard, hard work. But what we discovered is if we didn't practice and we didn't do it in the, in the training time, there's no way we could do it in the field. There's no way we, can, we could accomplish what we need to accomplish in the field. And so what would happen is the coach would, would correct us that we were playing wrong, we were running wrong, we were acting, we were doing the wrong play, we weren't paying attention. And he would always work at trying to shape us and correct us so when it came game time, we didn't have the wrong behavior, we were doing the right behavior. And not necessarily because we were thinking of it, it's just because it was second nature, it was muscle memory. We, we were used to doing the right, the right thing. It isn't easy to be disciplined. It's not easy to correct. It's, it's not easy to say, you know, that's not right. You need to stop that. Or this is what you need to do. And yet, when else do we do it? If we keep waiting, it's never going to get done. There's an old adage, an old proverb that says, when is the best time to plant an oak tree? When is the best time to plant an oak tree? And the answer is 20 years before now. Or right now. So in 20 years from now, you have that big oak tree. And it's the same with us in that discipline. As we correct what's wrong and make it what's right. And Paul does this in, in Corinthians when he confronts the sexual immorality in the church. And he challenges the, the man there. He challenges the people to go ahead and deal with it. It's painful. It's hurtful. But then it, it brings the person back to repentance and restores them back into their family. 
And, and he talks about these responsibilities of the family leader. But he also talks about responsibilities of family members. He says this. He says, now, in, in, in regards to their, their leaders, show them respect and hold them in the highest regard. Why? Because God is leading them. He's, he's got a responsibility upon them. And, and, and I think part of your role, part of my role, is to help make each other's lives a little bit easier. Not to, to make it so easy that there's not challenge, but, but to encourage people along the way. And I, think, and I know there's some people that feel like that it's their God-given calling to make the life of the leader miserable. I mean, if I, can just, if I can just tell that pastor what he did wrong, it's going to encourage him to be better. You know, if I could just encourage, you know, get that youth pastor, that children's pastor, if I could just straighten them out, that's going to be better for them in the long run. Well, yes, correction is important, but there's the other part of it too of encouragement, to bless and to lead and to, and to encourage people on by letting people know one way as we do that, by letting people know we appreciate them. I love our church for that reason, is you guys are so appreciative. I get letters, I get notes, I get calls. And my wife does, our staff does. Don't stop. You don't have to send anything. You don't have to give a gift. Sometimes just a word. That's really, that's important. Just to be an encourager. But not only to us, but think about, think about others in the church that, that do things that you never see. You see it when it doesn't go right. But what about the people that make sure we have coffee out between services? Or they bake cookies every week for you, and they pay for that out of their own pocket? Or what about the, the person that makes the mail run or, or deposits the checks or the person that counts the money or the person that, that does the contribution receipts or the persons that, that come in and work for a work day or, or the person that comes in during the week and just does little odd jobs around the church or the person that stuffs the, the envelopes in the chair? You thought that just happened, didn't you? You thought those pencils just appeared. But no, somebody comes and sharpens those pencils and puts them in. It's all done by volunteers. The person that mows the lawn, the person that takes care of the property, it's all volunteer. To find out who those people are, to encourage and bless them. Find out who's teaching in the classes. You know, find out who's teaching in early childhood and who's teaching in the children's program or, or children's church. And, and I think one of the most difficult things in ministry often is, is we, we give ourselves to that ministry, but we can't give ourselves without... Taken some, taking ourselves away. So we've got a whole group of people that during the worship service, so we can be in here and worship, they're watching kids. They're helping in children's church. They're serving in different areas so we can be here and listen to God and worship and say, well, this is wonderful. But we can only do that because we have a whole group of people who say, I'll be on a rotation system or I'll be there all the time. I'll watch the service later. Um, but a way of just saying thank you. Some practical ways to say, I appreciate you. I, I'm blessed by, by you. Maybe it's a note. Maybe it's a phone call. Uh, maybe it's a, a word of encouragement. One of the things we've done in the office, and I think you've all been recipients of it because we've sent a card to every single one of you, I believe, is uh, every Wednesday our pastors and staff come together and we... Um, just draw names of people in the church. And then we take time to write notes of encouragement. And then we take specific time right then to pray for every one of you by name and by need on those Wednesday mornings. And what's been neat is we've been able to, to do that for the entire church in the first three months of this year. So we've prayed for every person and every, every need that we've known of around just a round circle in three months. And so we're starting over again. So you'll be getting another note pretty soon as the Lord works it out. And then to hear people say, Pastor, you would not believe. I got your letter and that very time that you guys were praying for me, I was with somebody and I didn't know what to say and somehow I had the words to say what I needed to say. I had somebody tell me just recently where I was going through a very difficult time. I was very depressed and right at that time I just said, Lord, I can't do it on my own. And I sensed the peace come over and I got the letter two days later saying we were praying for you at this time. Wow. You know, God does work. God is working and he's doing that. And, and he's doing that just for us. And that's a simple way that we as a staff, as pastors, we want to say we want to do that for each other. But we need to do it together, don't we? 
That's why every, it's important for every Sunday school class to take care of those people on, the, on your roll, even the ones that don't come. Who else is praying for those? Every Sunday school teacher who teaches our children or our youth or adults, who else is praying for them? Who else is encouraging them and getting the class and getting other people involved in their lives spiritually to show them love and care and even appreciation? Making sure that when kids walk up and down the hallway, they're not just somebody else's kids, but they're our kids. You know them. You can call them by name or, or at least make up a name for them and call them that. But to, but to pour our lives and to be respectful, to be loving, and to be caring over them. Then he, he lays out some responsibilities for, um, in regards to other family members. Not only do leaders have responsibilities, but, but family members, us, all of us have responsibilities uh, to do in the, in the body of Christ. Mutual responsibilities towards one another. He, he says, warn the idol. Warn the idol. Um, what does it mean to be idle? That's a good question. In, in, in language of an automobile, uh, uh, to be idle is I've got the engine on, but I'm just sitting there and I'm not going anywhere. You know, I've got a semblance of something happening. I, I could easily put it in gear and go, but I'm not getting anywhere. I'm just idling. And, and, and the work that the Thessalonians were part of, the most important work is getting people ready. And, and they were getting them ready for, for living in life and, and pouring out their lives as a model to other believers. And they also had a deep passion to be ready for the Lord when he returned. And so he says, warn people not to be idle, but to be involved in, in ministry to other people that would lead them to faith in Christ. Another reason to warn the idol is that there's a, there's a danger in lagging behind. In, in nature, in war, and probably every aspect of life, it's the same principle. The person that lags behind is the easiest person to, or the easiest one to pick off. When, another, when the enemy's after them, they, they go for the stray. They go for the one that's by themselves. They don't go by the, for the one that's in the herd, in the group or with a group of people. They, they attack the, the, the lone person, the lone animal. And, and to be encouraged to, to, to warn people, don't, don't be drifting off. Here, come back in. Don't be idle. He also says, encourage the timid. And that, that word timid in the, in the King James and some other versions literally is the word that means discouraged. It's not just that they're, that they're shy it's not just that they're kind of um, a, an introvert, but it's that there's an element of discouragement that can be there too. They're feeling down. Even, even where they are, they're discouraged. And, and encouragement is a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool to lift people up and to bless them and to build faith in them. And, and I think one of the things that we can do for one another is to speak faith into each other's lives to speak it into our kids' lives, to speak it into our leaders' lives, to, to, to bless them, and to speak words of faith that, that literally are, it's kind of like a jolt of electricity. It's, it's uh, in the business world, uh, when I was, uh, years ago, it was called the power of zap. It's the electric power of zap, and it's basically just encouragement. Instead of kind of sucking the life out of the person with criticism and, and nitpicking, we we pour into them and we fill them with encouragement and blessings of God, and it encourages them. And understand that in the church family, you know, encouragement is like, is like a peanut butter sandwich. The more you spread it around, the, the better things stick together. You know, it's not just in a glob. You, you spread it out, and, and it really starts making a difference. And, and we all, not just leaders, as members of the body, have an encouragement have a responsibility to warn the idol, but also to encourage the timid. And then he says this, he says, help the weak. Help the weak. Encourage those. And I don't think he's talking about just the physically weak here. 
You know, this morning we had uh, Marie Fuel was coming out and she had high heels on and she slipped out here in the atrium and fell down on the ground. And so some people got around her and, and helped her get back up. And, and I think she was scared more than anything else. And uh, Eugene called me back and said, she's fine. Thanks for your help. Tell the church she's in good shape. She's just a little bruised up, but she's okay. And I don't think he's just talking about help the weak, you know, that I fall in and I can't get up. But he's also talking about the spiritually weak. The weak that, that's saying that, that I'm about to fall. I'm, I'm struggling here. Don't let them fall. Don't let them hold on to the weak, he's saying. Because otherwise they're going to drift off and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna be lost. And so watch out for them. And, and, and we're not let the, to let the weak simply fall to the ground. We're to help them overcome their weakness and grow and grow in the Lord. To be what God wants them to be and encourage them in their faith. I'm going to stop right there and we'll pick up the second part because it's good. It's all good, isn't it? But some, just some family matters of how to operate in the family. And these first parts are family responsibilities. And what we're going to talk about next are family priorities. What do we put as priorities in our life, in the church and in our families? This morning I shared with you what we believe uh, as a leadership team in Church Unique that we came up with five values that we believe are, are important. And they're not important just because there's something new, but, but I really believe, and, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I believe they come out of the DNA of who we are. Authentic relationships. Being the kind of people that that care for one another. Biblical faith. That what we do is based here. That we, we want to please God. We want to live according to his word. Now we're not talking about legalism. We're not talking about beating people over the head with the Bible. We're talking about being true and genuine to what's, in, what's here. And living in the spirit of the word. We're talking about abundant grace. Grace that, that's given to one another and it's grace that's received. That 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 we, one of the things I've loved about our church is even when sin has been exposed, it hasn't caused our people to withdraw from one another. It's caused actually our people probably to gather around to encourage and to bless one another even more. That's grace. That's abundant grace. Generous compassion. And that's where we probably... You know, we say, well, we need, we need to continue to work at that. We need to, to strive more towards being compassionate. Because it's not just having a food pantry. It's being caring in our spirit. And yet part of that caring is to have discernment, to not be taken advantage of, but to be wise. Jesus says you've got to be wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. And then we live in a world that's full of deception. And you would not believe some of the stories I've heard of needs of people. And I want to help people. I'm compassionate. I'll do anything I can for them. And yet, how disappointed it is to find out it was just a story. Not always. And that's what I always have to remind myself. Not everybody's a shyster. Not everybody's out and has an angle. they are people with genuine needs. And I need to have a compassionate heart enough to always stay in there to discern and find out what the real need is. Because there are needs all around us. And good people that have broken lives. And then that last one, aspiring to excellence. To say, Lord, help me just to do my best. And everything that I do, I do to your glory. I would love to hear back from you. I'd love for you to talk to any others about, about those values. And, and kind of where you see those falling in your life or in the church. Or if you have uh, different insights, uh, I'd love to hear from you on that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for being a part of your family. You are Father. We're brothers and sisters together. We're your children. And to think of the privileges that we have together in the family. You have many rooms for us, and you're preparing a place for us, but, but it's not just in heaven that we get to enjoy what it means to be part of the family of God. It's here on earth to be part of your church, to be part of your fellowship. And that means also that that there's all kinds of responsibilities and needs as a part of this family. There's people who are hurting, 
There's people that are struggling. There's people that are weak. There are people that are idle. There's needs that be, need to be met. There's, there's situations that need to be overcome. There's, there's sin that needs to be corrected. There's words of encouragement that need to be shared. There's gifts of service and, and encouragement and lifting up that need to be shared also. Thank you for these people. Thank you for our family. And I pray that you would so work in our lives, even, even, even to the depths of who we are, to continue to meld and join our hearts together for the purpose of the gospel, to connect people to a vibrant life in Christ, to live it out in every aspect of who we are together alone and together. Lord, thank you again for your will and for your work in us. Lead us on to be a reflection of that will and work. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Stand and rejoice in the Lord.